This episode was brought to you by Big Moose. Find out about the One Million Project at bigmoosecharity.co. Pals. Pals, greetings. Greetings and welcome once again to an episode of Everything Endurance. Back in your ears, twice in quick succession. I'm treating you well. Uh, it's it's like back to lockdown times, getting them out this frequently. Um, I can't swear we'll exactly stick to the schedule, but we've we've got more episodes in the works, so keep your ears out. I'm very excited about today's episode. I'm going to try and keep the preamble short, but I can't promise anything because once I get started talking about this particular topic, I'm very difficult to stop. I only really came in contact with ultra running for the first time back in about 2015, somewhere around there. I knew nothing before that. I was a real ale swilling kebab aficionado and punk rock guitarist. I was not into sport in any way. I was not a runner. I didn't lift anything heavier than pints. And then I found out about ultra running and suddenly realized that around me were normal people walking the streets among us who were capable of just running a hundred miles at a weekend or taking on races over 250 miles. I, I was blown away. I didn't know there was this secret society of people creeping around amongst us. Now I've had the absolute privilege of being amongst those people for a good few years. And one thing has stuck with me from that earliest time, because one of the first races I came in contact with, one of the first races I read about was the Barclay Marathons. So for the benefit of anyone out there who doesn't know what the Barclay Marathons is, we are discussing a race that has been ongoing since 1986 in Frozen Head State Park in Tennessee. On paper, we're talking about five 20 mile loops, only it might not be 20 miles. It might be significantly more than that. Nobody's entirely sure, it seems. Equally, it's hard for you to follow the trail on account of the fact that often there isn't a clear one at all. You'll be carrying a paper map, but no GPS device. The nearest thing you'll have in terms of electronic device support is a watch, but that watch has been given to you by the organizers. It will only display time and there is no guarantee it will work particularly well. Unbelievable. You will not find aid stations, only water drops. You will not find checkpoints, only books in hidden locations. And you will have to remove a page in order to prove that you have been there. There's no GPS tracking for the people at home. There's no social media team relaying the entire story back to everyone. Just a single official slash unofficial account on Twitter giving out scant news, often purposefully shrouded in mystery. Since the beginning of this race, only 17 individuals have ever finished, and each time Laz, the organizer, feels like it's getting too achievable, he pushes the goalposts a little bit further away and makes it harder. Given there were three finishes this year, who knows what he's got in mind for the course next time around. This race has fascinated me for a long time. If you want to learn a lot about it, and there is a lot to learn, go back to episode 36, where I got to interview the amazing Gary Cantrell, aka Lazarus Lake himself. Uh, Just one of my favorite interviews of all time. So if you want to know more about the race in detail, go back and have a listen to that. But in a nutshell, that's what the Barclay is. Also, My contact with the ultra running scene has predominantly been through the work I do with Beyond the Ultimate, the work I do with the Spine Race, and the Barclay Marathons are just out there doing everything differently, plowing their own furrow. They are a mystery of an event set up for runners. It is hard to see into that opaque bubble that's formed around it. They they don't shout about what's going on. They don't give out a lot of information. And that just makes it more compelling for me. So each year when the race comes around for the 60 hours of the event, I will be on Twitter endlessly refreshing, looking for any bit of information I can glean about what's going on out there. It is compelling. And this year, more than most, this year, I, you know, I had the honor of personally knowing some of the runners that were involved in the race and felt even more invested than before. And some of those runners are people we're going to talk to today. And I was so excited putting this episode together. This was a great opportunity to talk to some people I really enjoy talking to um, about 
uh, something that I absolutely love. So, you know, what's what's not to love about that? We are going to be talking to a group of people, one of whom was out there doing the Barclay Marathons for the first time and got onto the fourth loop, which is just incredible. There are plenty of repeat offenders in the Barclays who've who've never gone beyond the first loop. So like an outstanding performance there for a start. We're also going to be talking to the woman who has put in the best performance of a woman ever in the Barclay Marathons, a woman who we already know is capable of absolutely incredible things um, and has gone out and done an incredible thing once again. We're also going to be talking to somebody who is among the tiny, tiny group of people who since this race started in 1986 have actually managed to finish it. Not only that, but this year was his second finish. Um, Again, he's also a record breaker for the most appearances on this podcast. Um, So yeah, I mean, I've got three great guests for you to, to listen to right there. And then... I've got you a bonus guest that made me so happy. So very, very happy. Each year, I am fixed on Twitter, as I said. And there is one person's account who is absolutely key. Keith Dunn. Keith Dunn is the only official slash unofficial outlet of official information from the Barclay Marathons. He will be there each year at the Yellow Gate, tweeting out what information he has access to with the scant signal he has, and even then adding an extra layer of mystery here and there just to be playful, because because why not? Why not add to that mystery around the race? It's like solving a true crime. It is such good fun for my brain to get into following the race the way this guy does it and and i absolutely love it and it coming from the point of view where i am where i am you know one of the guys at the front of the social media coverage of all of the races that i cover this guy is that guy for the barclay marathons and i managed to get in touch with him we've been chatting backwards and forwards via email and we managed to set up a time and actually talk face to face and it was great so keith if you're listening to this and i hope you are it was an absolute pleasure pal and uh, thank you very much for talking to me again so yeah bear with me guys you'll get to that episode uh, you'll get to that part of the episode later on um and stick with it to hear me geeking out and being an absolute fanboy with the amazing keith beyond that We've also got the return of Adam Kimball for another Radness update. Um, Continuing the theme, since we're going to be in Tennessee for the Barclay Marathons, uh, we're sticking to the US. Adam Kimball being our eyes into America. He has just been out and done the Cape Fear 50 mile race. I say done it. What I mean by that is won it and set a course record. So Adam congratulations mate i'm gonna take the opportunity here to um you know wish massive congratulations to a friend of mine and an absolutely delightful guy incredible work adam but not only does he get that course record not only does he get that win that has also qualified him to run the Badwater 135 in 2024, another absolutely iconic event. So Adam is there at the end of the episode. I know a lot of the listeners to this podcast, like me, are UK-based or at least Europe-based, and we don't necessarily know all the ins and outs of the American ultra-running scene, how the entry systems work, what the big races are, what the feel of them is. And Adam is right there and right in the thick of it. He's going to be preparing for Badwater 135 over the next couple of years, along with all the other amazing ultra running feats that he does. So he is here at the end of the episode to talk you through all of that. Uh, I'm not going to interrupt you anymore. We're going to get straight into it. I hope you enjoy this episode as much as I enjoyed making it. And uh, yeah, here we go. First up, we're going to talk to the amazing Damien Hall. Good afternoon, then. Damien Hall. Damo, it's delightful to talk to you again. How are you doing? I'm very well, thanks. Will, how are you? Yeah, yeah, not too bad at all. Not too bad at all. I, uh, you know, I do seem to talk to you guys quite a lot. You know, I, I've spoken to John already for this podcast. I, I, I feel like, you know, I'm prying into his life on a pretty regular basis. You guys just keep doing awesome things. So uh, congratulations. Your, your first stab at the Barclay went pretty well. How did... 
I, it, it, how do I ask you to encapsulate the experience in a sentence? Uh, uh, but, you know, how was it? <laughs> um, I, it was it was more amazing than I than I thought. Um, I must admit, for, for a long time, I did I did see it as something. I don't know. There, there is it can be seen as a, a bit gimmicky or a bit of a, a very strange event uh and it is quite exclusive although that's not down to to Laz himself that's more down to sort of you know the the, the park and, and land regulations in, in the US um which is a shame um but does add to the special nature of it um yeah I mean I'd wanted to do it for years um I just got bored of people saying yes but will you do the Barclay uh if I'm honest and then and then I suppose yeah getting to know John a bit Jasmine going Nikki Spinks going you know friends who who come back and go wow you've got to try this um it was amazing it was it was more special than i imagined the course was more beautiful actually than i imagined um and just the experience was it was the community there was more welcoming if i'm honest i thought it i feel mean saying this now but i thought it might be a little bit sort of cliquey and and sort of an old boys network type of thing but they were very welcoming um yeah i had a wonderful time and and um yeah but 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 this nagging sense of um your part of me is really, really pleased with how it went. Only only 19 people apparently have ever got to start a fifth loop, but they're not my fifth loop. I couldn't even find the first book. So, <laughs> so there's part, yeah, I'm partly really satisfied and partly really frustrated. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's a unique race in a lot of ways, but that's a fairly unique position to be in, isn't it? To have put in one of the sort of most exceptional performances, but still feel like you fell short somehow. I, 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 I don't know how you compute all that when you get back home. Well, well, John has um, kindly pointed out that only me and Gary Robbins uh, have ever started a fifth loop, but not finished a fifth loop um, in, a, in a subsequent year. So, so, so people have started a fifth loop and, and been unsuccessful, but then they've always gone back and, and finished it. So that sort of bodes well, I, I suppose. Um, but yeah, just me and Gary Robbins are the only people, two people to have ever done, ever done that, I think. So yeah, it's one of, the, one of the most exclusive clubs in ultra running, which I'm sort of proud to be in and, and sort of frustrated to be in. Yeah, that's got to be odd. It really has. Um, you stuck on something really nice there, though, that I enjoyed. There is there is an impenetrable nature to the Barclay, which, you know, from, from my point of view as a spectator, is part of what I enjoy. It's like solving a true crime, trying to piece together what's happening on that event. And I, I, I love that. It's also what we do know about the Barclay is it's incredibly tough. People don't make it. It's it's going to kick you in the pants. There's no support. Like it, we talk about how hard it is. I mean, that can't be all there is to it. So you said it was actually a pretty beautiful trail. Like what what can you tell me about the Barclay that's positive? Well, yeah, I mean, we we did have apparently, you know, probably the best weather it's, it's had for a long time. So we did have in the daylight it was mostly sunny so of course you've got the sun coming through the trees the leaves hadn't come hadn't, hadn't sort of grown yet so you get good views in the woods um and and even the nighttime were quite clear and we could see the stars and and some you know quite cool moon early on it was quite sort of orangey at one point or, or pinkish so so yeah quite and um nature wise yeah i saw a raccoon in the night um halfway up a tree and then i never saw any hogs but there are wild hogs there and we heard some charging around um and actually uh on a on a recce run with john yeah we were inter we interrupted a rattlesnake which got quite grumpy at us actually which was quite a quite a moment so um yeah so beautiful moments with nature um and I, yeah purely from a sort of self-centered performance point of view like physically i was i was up to doing five loops so that was and, and quite close after the spine so that was really reassuring for me but yeah I, I probably I failed on the almost the intellectual side or the sort of skills navigation side or maybe sleep deprivation management side um but it's um yeah it is a very special event it feels special when you're there and yeah I just feel very lucky to have had had one go I sort of hadn't thought there too much about how fast that turnaround really was like it, you finish in the spine and then getting yourself ready for the Barclay again, that didn't leave you a great deal of turnaround. Was was there anything you did different training-wise to try and have yourself in the best condition? Let me think. How many? I'm not sure how many weeks it was. So it was like mid-January, wasn't it? And then this was mid-March. So I guess it was it was around eight weeks. Um, I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm lucky to be coached by, by David Roach. Um, and he was definitely very, yeah, definitely no running for a, 
at least a week after the spine um and then two very two quite conservative weeks you know um not even running six days a week which i normally would um and and yeah it was quite yeah we just backed off we just backed right off and and i did seem to recover quite quite well quite quickly which hasn't always been the case as, as i age i'll be honest um but this time felt good maybe just because i was more happy with the result than, than normal um and then yeah there was time for like i suppose two big weeks of of trying to get good vert in um and then it was sort of taper time and time to to go to america so it was um there wasn't loads of time but then yeah i mean once you've done the spine you you are pretty fit um it's it, so i think the priority is making sure you're well rested and well recovered um and yeah that involves lots of cake lots of cake and snoozing good. Which, yeah i'm getting i'm getting pretty good at yeah excellent i mean that's a good part of the job right cake and sleep and tea um how prepared can you be going into the Barclay? Like, obviously, you've got access to some people who've got a bit of an inside line on it who can give you some advice, but how well prepared can you really be? And I guess leading on to the next question, can you sort of dare have expectations going in? Like, did you have a loose target in the back of your head or I do you just have to go in there and take what comes? It's, it's a great question because... Yeah, you, you're not allowed. So I did go out there early. Um, I was out there for a full week beforehand, but you're not allowed to recce the whole course. Um, in fact, you can only recce the trails, which is which is about a third of it. So that's helpful. Of course it is. But the main, where, where all, nearly all the books are and, and the main tough climbs uh, and descents are all off trail. So, so like the day before the race, you know, uh, I didn't know book locations. And I didn't know the route until I saw Laz's, you know, the master, the master map, um, you know, the afternoon before the race. Um, so John, John Kelly, the T Dodger was, he was really helpful to me. Like um, we, we did three or four runs together where, where he took me around the trails of the park and he would point out one or two things, but he, he never said there'll be a book there or there'll be a book there. Cause there's a, there's, there's, there are a lot of ethics around the race that aren't, written down um and you only really sort of learn as you go really um and some of that is to protect the secrecy of the race and and some of that what i realized actually the secrecy of the race isn't isn't sort of a gimmicky kind of hey we're going to keep it all secret part of it is to preserve the race as a, as a real thing because it has been under threat before quite seriously and and that could happen again that, that's partly why not many people are allowed and, and he's really laz is really protective of the start date and obviously the the actual route um and also the application sort of date um they're definitely things you know it would not be if i gave those away it would not be popular uh i probably wouldn't yeah get another chance uh i guess but but they, yeah there's a whole massive gray area in between which um a sort of ethics that people pass on to each other like like john wasn't going to show me like his map of the actual route for example i mean i didn't ask but that wasn't that's not really something that happens so it's quite yeah it's quite interesting so you can't really recce it or you can recce only a little bit of it so that was in that respect a first you know a first run there is 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 your recce so i've, I've done a good recce um now um i've done four loops um but I suppose, yeah, there's, there's the fitness, there's the sort of mental, getting mentally in the right place, um, navigation skills, things like that. But yeah, it's hard. It's a hard race to, because nearly every other race in the world, you can go and recce the route and um, this one you can't really. So, Yeah. I mean, the Pennine way is the Pennine way. If you want to know where the spine race route goes, you can, you can Google it. That's fine. But yeah. And I get what you mean there as well. Part of the appeal of the Barclay is that it's this, this small thing in a, in an, in an amazing wild area where it is, but it has to stay that small thing or, or it's under extreme threat really, doesn't it? Which is a really, really difficult balancing act. Um, and something I guess I'll be, uh, I've got a surprise guest coming up soon and I'll be uh, asking him a few questions about, but, um, I, sorry to bring you back to the moment, but we've, we've talked about you headed out on that fifth lap and didn't get a book. And Jasmine Paris described a situation whereby she came across you on the trail and it being a bit of a piecing together of a jigsaw without the picture on the box when you're following the, uh, the, the Barclays. I'm not entirely sure what happened there. So would you mind talking me through that, that sort of end of the race? Uh, yes and no. Um, <laughs> so 
so yeah, I, I I got back. I did I did my four loops in in enough time to be allowed to go out on a fifth loop by only um, yeah I think I'd half an hour. I'd half an hour by the time I left camp again. I was ten minutes under the cutoff, so reasonably tight. And I'm not used to being near cutoffs. Um, now in my head, I had twelve hours left to do that loop, and we'd done the first loop in eight eight twenty eight eight seventeen. Um, so in my head, twelve hours was was sufficient. Now my crew member has since told me, and he's done started the Barclay five times. He said he gave me 15% chance. And, and that wasn't based on my my skills necessarily. That was more that, and I've looked now, like no one does 12 hours on, on a fifth loop. It's 13 or more. Um, I think simply people are so tired. They're definitely on their own. Um, and almost no one makes it that far anyway sort of thing. So I was heading out of camp full of optimism. Everyone else was like, yeah, see you in a bit. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, and I, I, yeah, there was a long climb. It was getting sunnier. Um, I still, yeah, the, the sleep, the sleep monsters started to return. But, but that first book had been really easy coming the other direction. And you've got all these capstones, they call them, big, big rocks, basically. And they have lots of <laughs> book-sized gaps in them. Um, there's, so there's lots of them and lots of gaps. But it was still really easy to find it from the other direction. But yeah, at first I couldn't find it and I was yeah you go back and forth and then and then i sort of ran a long way the other way to, to approach it from the previous direction that i had you know just two hours ago it still didn't you know lead me to the book and and, and you're basically very tired i've been up for um nearly 50 hours at that point um you, yeah you're, you're very tired you're sleepy you're frustrated so i'm looking and looking i suppose and and but then i started to believe instead of you're not in the right place i started to believe you're in the right place but the book isn't here uh and then you start well maybe a crow went off for it maybe a hog went yeah. off maybe i misplaced it last time uh and only one runner would have gone through in between maybe he misplaced it he's very tired so you start telling yourself these things i suppose um and then after yeah after an hour i realized well i've only got 10 hours left for the loop um is there any point in going on it's not going to count so i started wandering back towards camp but not before placing a couple of biscuits uh to, <laughs> to prove in my head that was it. how can i prove i was actually here and biscuits. i was like well i don't leave any litter biscuits yeah i don't leave any litter i'll leave a bit of food um placed a couple of biscuits uh because i thought someone will return to collect the book at the end of the race at least they will know look he was in the right place or he was in the wrong place now um and then i started so i started wandering yeah jogging back down the mountain this is on good trail this bit and, and the day just warmed up. And because I think the race was over, my mind finally relaxed. And I was like, you know what? I'm really tired. I'm going to have a, I'm going to have a nice sleep. So I literally lay sort of head in the leaves across the path because I hadn't seen anyone for an hour or so. Um, yeah, fell asleep. And then pesky Jasmine uh, woke me up. Um, I don't know if that was half an hour later, 10 minutes later. Um, and one of the first things I said to her was, oh, did you find the book up there? And she's like, yep. Yeah. So that was a bit crushing. <laughs> <laughs> so that was, yeah. Yeah. So Damn. there we are. That sums up the difference to me and Jasmine Paris, I think, right there. Yeah. There you go. She knew where the book was. Uh, it, oh. <laughs> I can only imagine. I can only imagine what that's like as a mental process at that point. <laughs> just sort of lying in the ground, head in the leaves. Oh, the book was just there. Great. Thanks. I'll go back to camp then, shall I? Like, it's, it's such an odd way to end a race, but I, yeah, I, yeah. I, I, I imagine the reception's still great when you wander back down towards the gate, though, right? Well, it was nice. So I, I ran, yeah, I ran all the way down with Jasmine, and you know, we had a nice chat, and she's a great friend, and um, and then I sort of let her, yeah, let her go and finish first because it, you know, it was, it was the strongest ever female performance at Barclay. So you know, yeah. I, I wanted to stand back and watch it. I didn't want it. She actually was saying, "Come in, run in with me." I, I think, and I was like, "No, no, no, you, you know, go and have your moment." And I could sit back and watch as well. Um, and that was really cool to see. Uh, I mean, it's not like UTMB. I mean, there, there were, you know, fifteen, ten or fifteen people there. You know, but you still think this is this is cool. Um, and then when everyone had sort of yeah died down and started started walking off, I thought I'll just tiptoe. I'll just tiptoe in now. Um, uh and yeah got got taps played i guess there was a moment where i thought i might not even get taps played this might this might go well but yeah got taps played explained ex um returned a paper bag to laz because he he was very worried that i was going to litter i'd taken a, a paper bag with some snacks uh and he was very concerned about it um it, it was quite sweet actually but i made sure i brought that back for him um explained i'd left him some biscuits up on the hill 
Um, I don't think he commented on that. I think he just thought, you're very tired, aren't you? <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, played taps and, and then, yeah. And then, I mean, had an amazing rest of the day, you know, just chatting to Ian Keith and uh, Nicky Spinks and Tom Hollins and uh, amazing people, uh, uh, Harvey Lewis and, and people like that and um, Dan Jasmine and... Um, and and then we yeah we saw the three finishes come in later which was just amazing and just yeah just stokes your fire even more i suppose so it was um it was still a, an incredible day oh, i'm excited just hearing about it it's, it's it's like ultra running christmas and and in laz you've got ultra running santa stood there waiting for you it's it, it it's everything in one place i absolutely love that uh, so i mean a couple of questions i've i've already held you for a little while but um one thing i've been asking everybody is there's you know, there's always a chance people are going to be listening to this podcast because they've had the misfortune to be selected for next year's Barclay and they're trying to glean a few nuggets of information out of this. Is is there a thing that you would say those people should be doing to prepare themselves for this? Where you, be it training, research, mindset, whatever, whatever it is, is there a thing they should be doing first? Yeah, I think there's probably, there's probably two things that stand out. Um, and one is one is night nighttime navigation, you know, in woods off trail. Um, now it's not it's not an orienteering race. It's not like say the arm where you're, you know, trying to find a you know a, a tiny rock under a, you know, in the middle of a moor. Um, it's not that difficult. But when it's dark and you're very tired and you're just it's nearly always in woods. I would just try to practice practice that in some way, whether that's in a race or, or lessons or, or just you know doing that yourself um that's that to me was the most difficult element um and then and then the other thing is physically preparing for just a lot of steep power hiking it's very very steep um you can't i can't quite you know i was warned how steep it was it's not like utmb where it's kind of lots of vert but but those european races are often you know uh switchbacks so at the actual gradient you're going up your physically your body is at isn't that steep necessarily whereas the Barclay is straight direct up something very steep and, and there's a lot of that so it's it's more of a hiking race than a running race you don't get to run very much um really but yeah practice that steep steep hiking um and and practice yeah nighttime navigation I would say they're the two they're the two things um yeah excellent two for the price of one there from Damien much much appreciated um, and you know, I, I hate to ask this because you touched on this near the start of the episode that part of the reason maybe that you end up looking at the Barclays is because everyone's asking you in your position, are you going to go and do it? So, I, I mean, I hate to start that wave again, but do you, do you feel like this is unfinished business or have you scratched your Barclay itch? What, 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 where does, where has the race left you? you? You're not committing to anything here. I'm sure Laz isn't listening, but... I'm yeah I I've thought of nothing else since I've got back <laughs> um except the spine race of course oh of uh, course no I'm very yeah I, I I I don't know if I'll get back in uh but I'm very very keen to try again because what yeah I'm very disappointed with how I performed in a sort of almost intellectually or, or a skills level um whether that's managing sleep deprivation or, or lack of navigation can't quite be sure because I was I was very close to the right spot if I wasn't at it um but but physically, I was, yeah, I was really happy. You know, physically, I could do five loops. Um, you know, I was, I was, yeah. So, so I was very happy about that. So, yeah, no, very keen, very keen to have a, to try again because it was, you know, relatively close, I suppose. So, yes, well, perfect. If yeah. Laz is listening, there yeah. you go. <laughs> He's definitely up for it. Yeah, perfect. Um, yeah, also, one thing that's sort of unique to you and Jasmine, and I, I talked to her about it as well, uh, in this race anyway, is your attachment to green runners as well. And I, you know, I don't think we've chatted on the podcast very much recently on account of me not recording all that many episodes. So we, we probably haven't had much of a catch up in that area. But what does that add? I mean... Is that extra motivation for you going out there, sporting your sort of green runners message or, or, or does that add a little extra pressure almost? And yeah, just I'd, yeah. I'd like to hear a little more about that. Well, it's a, it's a great question. Well, and very, very delicately put. Um, <laughs> yeah, I guess the truth is uh, I, I, I won't talk for Jasmine. I'm, I'm sure she's given a much more eloquent response than me. Um, we're, yeah, we're both 
co-founders along with about 15 people of the of the green runners um and and one of the elements there is is yeah keeping an eye on your own footprint and and actually travel will be the biggest part of an individual's individual runner's footprint and also for an event the biggest part of an event's footprint will be the travel to the to the event to and from the event uh, and if a flight is involved then that's the, yeah that's that's huge that's another another le level um so personally i yeah that's the only flight i've done in, in in four years and i made a sort of list and i used to fly yeah probably three times a year for running you know to, out to europe to do races and, and then i realized yeah you could you could get the train which is often a quarter or a third of the footprint um so what i did is i made a list of kind of okay which races and challenges do i really really care about like which ones really matter to me and barclay was top and so it was like, well, if you're going to fly again, you know, what, 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 yeah, what would it be for? So I have scratched off some races, Diagonal de Fou, um, for example, which I would have loved to do, but it's just too far away. Um, I guess at the moment I'm reconsidering Western States. I usually apply every year in the ballot. I'm trying to think now, do I really like, do I really want to do it? I might, I might take that off the lift list if I'm on it. I, I guess I, I've said this publicly now, I probably have to, but um, I mean, Hard Rock is, is another one. I probably, you know, I'd love to do that. I'd, I'd probably still fly for that one, um, but probably not as the same year as doing Barclay. Like a, once a year is enough for me, for, for my, now I'm not telling anyone else what to do. Um, I just am more comfortable not flying or once a year at the absolute most. Um, I guess the other, and, and yeah, that still displeases some people and I get a little bit of stick on social media, although, although yeah, of course. I thought I would. Um, but one, where this whole debate, um, be divided is like yeah individual individual footprint reduction versus pushing for system change uh and to me pushing for system change and and to various academics and, and commentators is, is far more worthwhile but then that's a bit of a vaguer term for people and, and um more confusing of what does that mean i mean the obvious thing is you know voting for, for, for parties that care about this stuff but you only get to do that once every five years really um in national elections anyway so that that's not that satisfying um so i would say anyone else who's yeah who's interested to to push those buttons to me it's i suppose it's emailing you emailing your mp and if you sign up for say greenpeace uk then they they could pretty much do it for you you can you can email your mp in 30 seconds and they'll do it at relevant times as well when votes are coming up in the house of uh, house of commons or, or house of lords um you know get out in the streets and protest it, it, there's a big one coming up in i think it's april the 21st extinction rebellion um going to have big protests in london you know come along join the green runners we'll keep you up to date with these sorts of things speak to brands speak to events some of this pushing the system can be just polite sort of saying oh i notice your event doesn't doesn't really fit with public transport times is that something you could do like that could actually be a huge change better than getting rid of plastic bottles or, or t-shirts that could actually be a lot lower carbon released a lot less carbon released from a change like that um I'm getting a bit waffly but i suppose my point is yeah i will i will be a hypocrite to some i i don't think you know to a sort of semi-professional elite elite runner to fly one in four years i i think that's i think that's reasonable um I, and... i'm inclined to agree there to be clear oh, i'm not yeah. I, I, I don't want this to come across as a grilling um <laughs> yeah it, this no, seems reasonable to me <laughs> I, I think it's important to talk about actually because i think it's important to show you know to show almost a lack of perfection to show imperfect activism um because Otherwise, you know, we don't get the right people on on board. You know, most of us, it's not unreasonable for people to fly once a year, I don't think, but, you know, for a family holiday or something. Um, you know, the big problem is that there's a 1% of super emitters who are flying 20 times a year. Like, they're the problem, not not a family that flies abroad once a year. Um, so, yeah, sometimes the debate gets a bit skewed and we end up fighting amongst ourselves when we should be fighting, fighting, yeah, big oil, basically. Big oil, big ag and, and complicit governments um yeah hopefully that wasn't too waffly enough rounded rounded up there but um no yeah. no i think you covered everything it, it, it just makes sense you are a person living within a system and that system really is what has to change and you know what you are doing is making a lot of difference spreading a message and changing your own behaviors in line with your beliefs and that's that's not always going to be a a perfect thing that you're doing but a flight across from time to time isn't going to cancel out everything you've done is, is where I keep ending up. And yeah, no, I, I, I think you've uh, quite concisely tied all that together, Damien, which, <laughs> which is great. We've just solved climate change uh, in a uh, in a 25 minute interview. So I'm, I'm pretty pleased with how that worked out. <laughs> well, thank you, Will. Yeah, I mean, I do get I do get um, a bit of anxiety around it and a bit sort of, I don't know, imposter syndrome, I suppose, like I'm championing it one minute and then 
you know, I get anxious a bit like taking a single a, a single occupant car journey because that's not brilliant. But sometimes it feels like the only realistic option. Uh, and yeah, I basically it's it's um it's tricky and it's not fair. I don't think that all of this is put on individuals. Um, to, to, you know, most of us do what we can, and it should be governments and, and these big companies sort sorting out the mess they've created. There you go. <laughs> I guess we're leaving on that note, which seems odd for a Barclay podcast, uh, but uh, but there we are. Um, congratulations once again, Damien. Like, I, I don't think I said the C word at the start of this interview, and it, it really was amazing. Uh, it's the most sleep deprived I've been outside of a spine race, just <laughs> constantly, constantly refreshing that Twitter uh, and hoping to see a Mohican pop up somewhere in a photo. <laughs> so I... It, Thank you for the experience and congratulations on how immensely well you did. And again, so shortly after after your performance on the spine in January. So, well, yeah. thank you, dude. Thank you. No worries. Well, I'll speak to you again after the next awesome thing you do, whatever it is. Cheers, dude. No worries. Have a good day, buddy. Hello, then. To Jasmine Paris. Jasmine, thank you so much for taking the time today. I, I imagine you've jumped straight back into home slash work life off the back of the Barclays. Uh, how are you doing? Yeah, I'm all right, thanks. Yeah, you're right. It's been straight back into, you know, being a being a mum of two small children doesn't leave you much time to kind of relax and I'm back at work full time. So, but yeah, um, but it's been nice to have um, lions till 7 a.m. each day rather than getting up at five to train. So I've been I've been loving um, the chance to sit with a cup of tea in the morning. Um, so that's been good. <laughs> Gives me a little perspective there on the amount of privilege I have, because a, a 7 a.m. alarm for me on a day to day basis when I'm working from home is a bit early. You know, <laughs> I've probably got something big on for, for you. This is, you know, this is the privilege. You're 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 finally getting a break and some time to recuperate. And you are juggling an an awful lot it let's dispel this straight away any idea that at the sharp end of the ultra running game it's all glitz and glamour you you do this on top of a very busy life yeah 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 no i feel um i mean i'm really fortunate to be able to run and like i you know i'm fortunate to be able to have a career and and, and be a mum as well so um but yeah is i wouldn't it's it is hard work and there's times when it feels like very hard work this autumn i feel like it was i was pretty tired actually in fact i had to kind of had a back off training a bit um just to give myself a bit of a break um so yeah that was part of the kind of the backstory leading into Barclay um, and why I was a bit nervous I guess going there this time as to whether I was going to be able to you know, how I was going to be able to compete there um but it worked out all right in the end <laughs> all right yeah <laughs> I've managed to get this far again without saying the word congratulations because I mean I I cannot tell you how much time I spent refreshing Twitter over the course of that <laughs> few days and how emotionally inv invested I was in in you getting around that course and there you go the the second woman ever to start the fourth loop that's pretty incredible um <laughs> but as you say, as you alluded to a little bit there, not necessarily the sort of ideal training cycle going in. So what what, what had sort of gone on there? Yeah, I mean, I think, I don't know, coming off the back of the ETMB, which I had a bit of a nightmare at, um, I think I was ill um, and a variety of things. And then just coming into the autumn, I don't know, I just, I guess more than any time since having two small children, I just, it just felt like a lot trying to balance work and training and, um, and, and being a mum. And I um, just, yeah, I just started feeling really tired. So it was just, I wasn't enjoying training that much. Um, and we talked about it with Damien, who's my coach, Damien Hall, um, and we just backed off. So um, it was good that I started feeling better around Christmas and then I developed bursitis in my knee, which I have chronic uh. problems with anyway, um, ever since I was 17 and I fell off a horse. So, um, yeah, so then I had to have like three or four weeks off. So I basically went into Barclay on the back of six weeks of solid training. It was good. Um, but ideally, you know, it would have been um, four or five months of good training. So it, it wasn't the ideal prep. Um, but I, I sort of went there knowing that I'd done what I could in the situation and, and I was like really kind of excited to give it a try and see what I could do. Um, obviously, the excellent weather forecast was um really, really positive thing that was definitely worked in our favour. Um, and there was loads of people over there that I knew as well. So it really it felt a bit like a party as well, you know, um, get going there and, and seeing everybody. So it was pretty exciting, despite the sort of um, slightly um, 
not ideal um, run up in, in terms of training. Yeah, you had a big group of spine winners on that start line as well. That must have been a little party over there. I love that. <laughs> yeah, it was nice. It was nice to be, you know, Damien and Nikki and um, yeah, lots of people. You know, I know John Kelly pretty well now as well. So it was it was good to to see everybody there. I, I mean, the Barclay, it, the Barclays is a very unique thing. It, it it is right at that outer edge of what can be done in a race, and everyone there is under an immense amount of pressure. Do you find you're carrying more pressure as you go into something like this? And I, I say this mainly because I, I was very invested in you doing this, and partly that's because you know we've met. I know you. I was there for the big spine finish, but I just want to see a woman finish that race. And I, you know, we're we're all sort of hoping it would be you in that moment. And does that sort of extra level of expectation weigh on you a bit when you go into an event like this? I guess maybe a little bit. But with Barclay, I, I really feel like you have to be doing it for yourself. Like you have to want it enough yourself. It's not, I mean, whilst it was absolutely incredible coming back and seeing all the support on social media. I mean, they, some of my my crew told me as I came through the checkpoints that it was it was crazy on social media. But, it, you know, and that was incredible when I came back and I find that very inspiring in itself. But that itself is not enough to take you around the Barclay course. You really, you know, when it gets really hard and, and when you're falling asleep on your feet and everything hurts, that that's not enough knowing that people are tweeting about you at home. You have to like really want it inside. So I feel like I, I create the pressure a little bit myself just by by wanting that and I I think it can be done I think a woman can finish five laps so like I, I sort of wanted to prove it you know and I think that's still there that that kind of desire to to show that so um I think probably the majority of the pressure comes from me but yeah you're right the now that I've done reasonably well in the last two times I think going back if I were to go back again then there would definitely be a certain level of expectation that you would achieve at least that which is by no means certain because you know the weather might be awful or you might get injured on loop one and so there's there's so many variables about that race that I think anything could happen uh, the last thing there is at the Barclays is certainty and yeah. uh, that goes for anyone it's it, it it's a leveler of an event for everyone involved in it um it, it, impossible for me not to ask really in my position as somebody involved in the spine race but how do those two experiences compare because I, I didn't get to ask you after your sort of first Barkley run um how do those how do the experience of going through the spine race that sort of 83 hours there compared to what it's like out on the course at the Barclays I mean there, there are similarities and um, but there are also big differences um so similarities for me would be um the, the requirement to dig really deep when it gets tough um the fact that you're on your own so like I certainly ran quite a bit of the later part of the spine on my own and I really had to like sort of dig in um and you know manage kind of sleep deprivation and darkness and kind of looking after yourself and maintaining maintaining a clear head when clearly all you want to do is fall asleep so those sorts of things are all similar very similar in the two races in themselves the races are are very different like you know the spine is is long um but it doesn't have that much climb relative to the length whereas Barkley is a lot of climb like more climb than any other race I've done it's constantly up and down and it's really steep as well the climbs are steep um the terrain's harder because you're not like on a trail for most of the time um, and although there's less bog um you know you've got kind of leaves and, and trees and other things um and the spine you sort of have more I feel like you you know you might there was remote bits but you were it wasn't that you know the kind of the two two bits were pretty remote um but for the rest of it it wasn't that uncommon to sort of see somebody like supporters out on the course and so on whereas at Barclay you, you know you, like for the later loops it was like 14 hours or whatever that was out and that you only maybe saw someone at the watchtower but the pe nobody else is allowed to be on the course anywhere so um unless you're seeing a fellow competitor then you just won't see anybody so it did feel a bit more remote so there's the similarities and, and differences i think john kelly said at one point which i kind of agree with when he was asked this question was that um the barkley holds you closer to the fire but the spine holds you for longer so um yeah probably probably something along those lines 
Yeah, I've heard that John Kelly line repeated a few times when yeah. this when this sort of question comes up, and it, it makes perfect sense. And as you say, in terms of isolation, obviously there's there's big bits of the Pennine Way that are pretty isolated, but there's also areas where you can stop and buy a cup of tea and a bacon sandwich at a roadside cafe if you want to. So it's sort of slightly yeah, yeah. less separated from reality than than the Barclays would be, I suppose. And uh, the interesting thing is Barclay, you know, like if you look at the park, it's not that big. Um, it's just it feels isolated and I think it's because you've been out there for that long without seeing anybody and it feels quite wild around you but if you actually look at the size of the park it's not you're not actually that far from civilization at any point you're probably much further at points on the Cheviots for example but it's just it's just that how feel of how how it feels given the terrain that you're going through and how long you've been away from anybody I think that's that's why it has that feeling you talk about time on your own. I mean, you really did this Barclay the hard way. You, you could see this sort of gaggle of runners at the front who, you know, we, they're either fighting each other to the death or helping each other along. But either way, they've, they've got each other to sort of fall back on in an emergency. And there, there was you, as far as we knew, uh, alone the, the entire time <laughs> out there. That, that must sort of add to the, the level of difficulty, I suppose, just, just being absolutely on your own and, and managing what goes on in that race. Yeah, there's two points on that. Um, I certainly ran parts of leg one with people and then leg two, quite a lot of that I did run with Jared's group, Jared and Carol. Ah. Um, That's it, so, we don't know behind the scenes. Yeah, yeah, no, so, I'm piecing they, this together. They dropped me, I think I had like a bit of a bunk at the like two books before the finish and they just dropped me on that climb, um, which was unfortunate because then I came back and if I'd stayed with them, it'd probably be better. You're right, it's much easier if you're running with people. Um, like from anything from the fact that you know you share the nav when something goes wrong you can work it out together and um, when you're having a bad patch you kind of get pulled along a little bit whereas when you're having a good patch you sort of um work more at the front and also like the pages even as simple as when you find the book um you rip out the pages for everybody you know that happens later on in the course when you're only the small number of people um and then and so that's all saves saves seconds um so that it does it does help to be with people um i definitely ran all of like three and four loop three and four completely on my own um so i think like if i were to go back and i was able to be with a group for more of it then it, that would definitely give me an advantage in terms of trying to do five loops um it would have ideally i would have ideally stayed with john kelly and damien at the start but i had this knee issue and it had definitely flared up and been a problem before the race so i couldn't really descend quite fast enough to stick with them um which i always knew was probably on the cards so um i gave it my best shot and i couldn't stay with them on the descent so um yeah that that was that was purely down to injury really so hopefully if i were to go back that wouldn't be such a problem um if if the knee had settled down in the future I, I so you did all of that carrying an injury as well which just sort of adds another <laughs> layer of impressiveness to it but um could you sort of talk me a little through that sort of fourth loop what how how did your your barclay experience uh come to an end this time around so I guess, you know, I, running through the third loop, I was still, I was kind of hoping, I knew re realistically that I needed to get back with a couple of hours spare over the kind of 36. I need to get back in about 34 hours to finish the loop four comfortably. Um, so when I kind of, when that sort of time disappeared and I came in with enough time to get out again on a fourth loop, but I, I was you know it it wasn't looking positive for finishing the fourth loop in time and i say that you know it's just realistic if you look at the times of everybody else that ran a fourth loop overnight nobody ran in less than it was like 13 hours or something you know certainly not less than 12 hours so um whilst i went out there you know wasn't writing it off i was going to do my very best but like realistically the chances of me finishing the fourth loop in time were pretty low um and then i got lost um you know like you and this time I actually got lost much less than last year um, and I made much fewer mistakes, but it's still really easy, especially once you get tired, just to make a small mistake. And um, even afterwards, when I was on a compass bearing, I just started on the wrong line a little bit. So I, I just ended up parallel to where I needed to be um, in really bad terrain. So that sort of thing that, you know, is quickly easy to quickly accumulate half an hour mistake and those mistakes add up. So anyway, on loop two, on loop four, the main things were that I was just falling asleep. So um, yeah just the first half of the night I found it really difficult to stay awake you know caffeine gels and caffeine and and uh, took a pro plus and I just tried to do everything that I could to stay awake and 
down to the fact that I, you know, I was happy to be a bit cold to try and stay. And it was very cold. So it was, that wasn't a difficult thing to achieve. Um, but I was still falling asleep on my feet. So you'd be like following these switchbacks and then suddenly you realise you just carried on and walked straight off the switchback and you had to kind of reverse and negotiate to try and find the path. Um, so, and I know that John Kelly and, you know, the others, the leaders all had problems as well um, during the night falling asleep. So, um, yeah, so then... Um, I, I think I, I I kind of got to the end of the 12 hours just as I was um kind of around the prison so just before book 10 um and um then I you know I by then I was so close to the kind of end of the loop and I'd know had at least one climb to do anyway so I just did the last two climbs and went back to camp along the it was nice it was really nice to be able to finish the fourth loop I kind of really wanted to do that um so um yeah so then I and um, so as I was dropping off the last summit as well, I kind of um, I was having lots of hallucinations. I'd, I'd been walking, if you like, with lots of people, lots of friends. Um, I'd been arguing with them about how far it was to the summit because I, I couldn't believe it could possibly be that far still. I'd been climbing forever type thing. Mm. Um, so, yeah, and I was seeing lots of weird animals and sculptures and things that obviously went in the woods. So the last last few hours are really kind of trippy. It was um it was like an experience where I was like sharing it with loads of people and loads of animals and creatures and and yeah and yet there was actually I was just on my own in the woods. Um it was really bizarre. And then the last kind of descent is when I found Damien lying asleep across the path and because I'd had so many hallucinations I assumed that it was just another one, you know. It's a look quite a few times before I convince myself it was really Damien so um we had a funny moment when he yeah when he when he was telling me <laughs> he was um yeah so he, he asked me if, if I'd found the book which he obviously hadn't been able to find and um yeah and then he yeah so we ended up walking back to camp from there um together or kind of jogging back down the final bit um which was nice to finish with someone although I'd obviously been would have been much happier if he'd finished um the right way around and found all the all the books on that last loop um, but hopefully we'll go back um, again next year and, and both finish it. That would be great. <laughs> ah, well, I mean, you've already preempted one of my other questions I've got written down here, which was, you know, do you do you have that hunger to go back and have another run at it? But it sounds like it it is there in the back of your mind. Yeah, I think when I first finished, I was uh, just, I mean, I wasn't entirely sure, or at least wasn't sure how long I would leave it because... Um, you know, this year we did have fantastic weather, so it, you could argue that this was the chance to do it, to try and finish it. Like this was, you can see by the fact that there were three finishes, you know, this was a fantastic year to give yeah. to give that a go. On the other hand, I know that I wasn't in the, like, much, I you know, tried very hard, but I wasn't in the perfect situation going into it. Um, so, and now, I, you know, now that it's, you've had a bit of time to kind of um, back away from it and, and sort of consider things, yeah, the the hunger there to do it again, to try and finish it is still there. And having said that, I'm not sure how many more years it will be there for, because it's quite a big, it's quite a big ask, you know, like you have to pour quite a lot of yourself into this race, both beforehand and then during it. And um, I don't know how many more years I've, I've got that in me that to be able to do that, but I'm pretty sure at least another one or two. So um, yeah, hopefully if Laz will have me back, I'll go back next year and give it another go. Oh, well, hopefully he's listening. I'm sure he's a big fan of my <laughs> podcast. Um, <laughs> but if you are Laz, the world wants Jasmine back. So <laughs> just, just planting that there right now. Um, I mean, what an incredible experience you had out there. And I, I part of what I love about the Barclay is is the mystery around it. There is something of an impenetrable bubble around it. And you're telling me things about the course that I could not know without having seen it myself. And it, it, it's absolutely fascinating. And I also don't want to burst that bubble too much. I, I, I like that it sort of keeps that sheen of mystery around it. So let's not pick into too many details. But something else I did want to ask you about was... Um, you know, I've asked you, is there extra pressure involved going out there trying to be a, a woman finishing the race? Also, you, you're quite outspoken about being a part of Green Runners and about how important it is to you to sort of control your oh, carbon footprint, such a problematic term in itself. But it, it, that this is something that means an awful lot to you is another another potential layer of pressure on you there as well I, I, do you want to talk a little about why that's so important to you and and does that spur you on a little more when you're out there yeah absolutely I mean you know I'm, I'm super I feel super privileged to be able to kind of I guess 
I've, I've been told, you know, there's there's two layers to this. I th- I've been told to that I sort of inspired, I've inspired lots of people, especially sort of women and girls in sport. So that's like one thing that I'm super proud of and feel very privileged to be in a situation to be able to do. So I think doing things like attempting the Barclay and, and doing well there, I, I, you know, it's fantastic if I can inspire people that way. And, and similarly, I feel really lucky to have this platform that I can use to inspire people to start thinking more about how they how we, how we are as runners and and, and more generally and um, you know just general, general everybody everybody really how we're sort of treating the planet and what we can do to try and minimize our footprint on this planet um so i'm kind of one of the i was one of the founding members of the green runners which is like a community of runners and anyone can join you just need to make a pledge to try and guess reduce your impact on the on the planet your your footprint and that might be along the lines of one of our four pledges so thinking about how you move how you speak out how you um kit up and how you fuel yourself um and um yeah so you need to make a pledge and you need to act on it so that's the really important thing so um we we're part of this green runners community and i went to barclay and i was no longer representing any sports brand i was just there representing the green runners which was really important for me um so I knew I was really pleased that it kind of did gain the green green runners lots of publicity and also lots of discussion. You know, people, um, it's a really um, it's, it's a subject which generates it's, it's very emotive. It generates lots of discussion when you talk start talking about climate change, um, and so I think it's good that people are having these discussions and thinking about it because that's the first step, and um, to trying to make positive changes to. Um, yeah, to protect our planet and um, for future generations. I mean, because I, I love I love the natural world and I, I lo- love my children and I want the future uh, future generations to be able to enjoy that natural world that we're so lucky to have. Which um, sounds like an incredibly <laughs> reasonable thing when you say it out loud, doesn't it? it, it <laughs> uh, and I get what you mean. I almost don't want to give air to this, but I, let's see where we end up anyway. I you it does start a debate and. You know, it is something that people are quite passionate about, whichever angle they're coming from. And one thing I see that has wound me up a couple of times is people coming back saying, well, did you swim there? You know, the the implication that you have cancelled out all that you have done before and all that you have said before by flying to this race in the first place. I mean, what's your response to that? You know, I mean, it's it's a really valid it's a really valid thing to say and it's it's definitely thing to something to be discussing um i i guess i would say so from my point of view the things that i've tried to do to reduce my travel i travel much less to races now um the only race i've flown to in the last couple of years has been Barkley, and i agree it's a long distance flight it's a huge thing i didn't fly to hard rock i didn't apply for hard rock knowing that i wouldn't want to fly twice in a year so um so for me as i guess a semi kind of professional um, or elite level athlete um, that was limiting myself to one flight to a race a year. Um, I also visited my brother. Um, so we we generally as kind of in the green runners say try to fly less or try to fly not at all. And if you are flying, try to make the most of it and make a holiday. So my my brother and his family live in the States. So I, I, I made kind of joined into a holiday to see them when I was there. Um, I think, you know, like with, with these things, I guess my pledge has been really to try and try and make a difference so that I've already, you know, made a big, you know, big changes in terms of how much I would be willing to fly and, um, and reduce that. And I think that the, you know, the, in terms of the message and that the green runners kind of got across and the discussion that it generated when I did go to Barclay, um, I think that's, you know, was pretty huge and hopefully um, that will have had some, you know, hopefully as well offset the you know the the flights over there so um just getting people talking about the green runners thinking about it and and perhaps if everybody else is taking one less flight then that will be you know that's going to be a really huge difference um so for for my one flight of the year where i went over there um and we did also carbon offset it but i know that's not not ideal that's not the answer to these things but um yeah so i i guess when we're none of us are perfect and we're we're starting to make changes i've certainly made changes and this is um this is this is my flight of of the year so um yeah 
that's hopefully that's kind of answered your question <laughs> no absolutely and I, I wanted to give you the opportunity to answer that question because i knew you would do it more articulately than i would <laughs> so i'm i really do appreciate that i'm i'm not somebody who ascribes to this idea that everything you've achieved over the course of your over the course of the time where you have been putting time and effort into minimizing your impact on the environment is somehow cancelled out by you taking a flight the idea that you know it it, it, that doesn't matter if if you're willing to do this when obviously we all live in the system that we live in and and you know i we're contributing to a carbon footprint right now by burning the electricity i'm using to do this call like you you can't exist without having some impact so exactly so you know i think the idea that hundreds of us could be better um you know by you know following the kind of principles the ideas of the green runners and making changes i I definitely have found personally that making small changes it kind of adds up and it's like a it's like a positive feedback and you tend to try and do more and more last year in terms of travel for example i traveled to the utmb by train because i was trying to avoid flying so for european races i i will travel by train um so for example the tour de Gion i'm going to in september again i'll travel by train so it really is just these long distance flights and there it's very much a case of choosing um choosing the one that would be most special that i would really want to try and do um but yeah i think it's a really valid conversation and that's it's good it's good that people are talking about it wonderful well look i've got two hopefully quite quick questions and then i really am going to release you from this uh, it, the first one is obviously it's easy to focus when you're looking at the barclays on how hard it is how grim it is falling asleep in mud you know getting tangled up in the undergrowth what's good it, there must have been a, a high point or two along the way are there are there any that stand out in particular yeah i mean absolutely to be honest this year i found I found I was spent, I spent quite a bit more time on the course this year, actually just genuinely enjoying it, like having tight one, tight fun. Um, I, I definitely noticed much more this year how beautiful the woods were and how beautiful. You don't get that much of a view because quite often, most of the time you're in forest, but there are some points. And actually on the last loop in at sunrise, it was one of the most memorable sunrises of my entire life and I've spent quite a lot of time in the mountains and seen quite a lot of sunrises and it was just really special it it was really because maybe because it was so cold and it was so pink like so dark kind of dark maroon pink the sky um and then everything was so clear and sort of pristine um yeah it it was a really special and maybe because I was slightly sort of um hallucinating and i don't know um but it was very it's very memorable sunrise so um i think there were lots of moments like that where moments in the first loop when i was felt really great running and it just sort of felt easy and exhilarating and fantastic and moments later on when i was tired but you know acutely aware of how beautiful it was and then there's like just the camaraderie and the kind of spirit of it i mean everybody came together at the end to be absolutely like you know thrilled for the three finishers um and it was you know exhilarating to see them finish so um yeah there's lots of things about the Barclay that are really positive and good um otherwise you yeah otherwise it would be very difficult to kind of balance out um the times when it's when it's so hard um but yeah I, I there was a lot a lot there that I genuinely enjoyed and, and thought was fantastically fun brilliant and and lastly, for the benefit of any poor soul who is listening to this because they've had the misfortune to be selected for next year's race and they're trying to glean a few bits of information that might help them out of it, what what one thing would you recommend somebody do in their preparation <laughs> for the uh, for the I almost said the spine race uh, in their preparation for the Barclays? Uh, um, I mean, if I had to say one thing, I I'd, I'd probably train for ascent. Um, like I think if you haven't got the ability to do lots of ascent on that course then you're doomed from the start I mean there's lots of things you could kind of add up and um, and, and say you need to prepare your nav and you need to um, you know um, you just read everything you can about the course and um, prepare yourself for really tough times and you know there's, there's lots of things but I think if I had to say one thing it would probably be that you need to be you need to be really good at sending um and obviously descending because you need to get downhills as well as going up (laughs) yeah yep that's how that works 
Well, <laughs> brilliant, excellent. Also, that's a different sort of nugget at the end there from what John gave. So hopefully we'll get something different from Damo and there'll be some really good info in here it's, for this misfortune at all that we're talking about. Um, Jasmine, thank you so much for today. It's been a, a pleasure to talk to you again. Um, I've really enjoyed it. And yeah, I, I hope you enjoy the rest of your busy day. I won't keep you any longer. You're welcome. Thanks so much. No worries. Thank you. Good afternoon, then. Once again, John Kelly. John, you have got to stop giving me excuses to ring you. I feel like I'm stalking you now. Are you okay? Yeah, yeah. It's uh, always happy to chat. I always enjoy it. Yeah, well, thank you. I I appreciate that. Um, so thanks for taking the time out of your day. We were just talking, and I've I've hit you in the middle of a work day, which for people as enamored by stuff like the Barclays and the monster stuff that you do, that just seems bonkers. Like if I was interviewing, say, a top professional footballer right now, I wouldn't expect them to just be between Zoom meetings, but you've just gone back to life as normal, right? Yeah, it, it helped a bit that the race uh, was, was Tuesday to Thursday this year. It used to be Saturday to Monday. And so it was, it, was, it was much more difficult to hop back into it. I at least had the weekend to try to catch up on sleep just a bit yeah well that's nice of Lars. we we appreciate that but before i get into anything it's sort of criminal that we're over the minute mark and i haven't used the word congratulations yet so <sighs> congratulations that was outstanding again as i was saying before i hit record that's the longest consecutive period of time i've ever spent refreshing twitter outside of working on a spine race behind the scenes that was mind-boggling i could not put my phone away uh i nearly ended up single by the end of the year 60 hours just congratulations man that was absolutely incredible i mean it, how does it feel to do it for the second time it, it was it was a great adventure uh, and and one that i i just i really got to enjoy uh, there were of course some some low points I had some low points early on it got really cold on loop two and there were those moments where I wasn't feeling well, I wasn't moving well, I was kind of trying to stay attached to the group, what we had together. Um, but, it, you know, outside of those, it was just, it was an enjoyable experience. I, I didn't have the crushing stress or anxiety of, of previous attempts where I kind of had this fear of not finishing. I was out there uh, enjoying the time and the mountains with people I don't get to see very often and places that I don't get to go very often. And in the end, I actually had a, you know, a, a beautiful sunset and pleasant jog into camp. I was actually coherent and knew what I was doing as opposed to the last time was just fog everywhere, fog around me, fog in my head, just, just a mess. A dream world. I, yeah. I I mean, you say you were more lucid as you got to the finish uh, finish line this time around, but did I read something about an old friend of yours finding you in the mud on the trail at some point during this race, or did that turn out to be a f sort of fever dream? No, it was it was actually true. It's uh, it, without a doubt one of the craziest things that's that's happened to me. I I tried to take a, a loop five nap, and the the watch the cheap you know, $10 watch that, that Laz gave me for the race, the alarm on it didn't work. The, the display would just flash, but it wouldn't make any noise. So, you know, what, what, what good is that? And so I kept trying to figure out ways that I could go to sleep without just sleeping through the end of the race. And uh, in my delirium, I came near an access road. I saw some muddy tire tracks and, and thought, well, that looks like a good bed. The mud will probably still be cold from the night before and, and it'll wake me up after a bit. And as I'm kind of laying down, pouring water over myself, preparing my bed, the, this guy walks back with uh, a, a woman and, and guy walks by with, with a woman and, and two kids. And I look at him and I just say, hey, oh, hey, hey, Kit. He says, "Oh, that's a John Kelly nap if I've ever seen one." And I, like, I, I didn't think anything more of it at the time. I, I laid down. They just kept right on walking. Um, his his wife had a very confused look on her face, as she should have. Um, 
but just just continued on and then i couldn't get to sleep i got up after another minute and continued on my own way and it was it was after the race that i was like did that really that doesn't make sense <laughs> like it you know who who just like what are the odds of it was thursday morning like what are the odds of that happening yeah this is a random the, midweek morning yeah, yeah and in my delirium being able to recognize this guy that i hadn't seen since high school like 20 years ago and just immediately just like oh hey kit and just and then him continuing on just as if it's perfectly normal oh there's john laying face down in the mud in the woods it's cool i'm just gonna gotta keep hiking and that's so the was, bit that strikes me most about the story i think is that yeah it, it, I, in any other circumstances walking past somebody delirious laying in the mud would be I, like that's not that's not a humanitarian thing to do but you take one look at you and you go ah that's a john kelly nap yeah so fortunately he knew enough about the race to to leave me be and to not uh drag me off the mountain and, and in my race uh but i i became convinced that i had just hallucinated the whole thing which i was a little bit excited about because i've despite all these things I've done, I have never experienced a legit hallucination. Like I'll see a rock out the corner of my eye and think it looks like a person or, or something momentarily, but never like a persistent, vivid hallucination. Uh, and so I thought I'd finally gotten that. But just to be sure, I, I hunted him down on LinkedIn of all places for you know a nice professional conversation and uh sent him a message and he replied oh yeah that was us we <laughs> we have been camping up there and uh i just finished explaining to the kids about barkley and uh and there you they were thought, they thought you were crazy but then and 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 you are and there you were so as if to, to prove you. his yeah. point in that moment there yeah, you were so uh, so hopefully you know I'll, I'll reconnect with him sometime and more normal circumstances maybe learn some more about what i actually said uh in the moment because i i, I don't know I, I he probably has a much better recollection of it than i do oh, amazing well i'd love to hear the end of that story at some point but that that's incredible that it turned out to absolutely be true not it's almost wilder than that having been a hallucination that that turned out to just yeah. be a massive coincidence yeah love it um so going into this for a second time, I mean, you kind of preempted one of my questions when you were talking there, which I was going to say, having got a finish under your belt, does it take a little of the in-race pressure off you? Like, did you, were you able then to uh, enjoy this experience as much as you can enjoy a Barkley experience? Yeah, I, I really was. And uh, I mean, crazy as it sounds most of this race is legit type one fun for me like i'm actually having fun while i'm doing it um again not not 100 percent of the time of course um but it, it does take that off but it also it makes it much more difficult because it removes a lot of the the motivation you, you know going from not finishing to being a first time finisher like that's that's a big achievement a, a big personal accomplishment uh, that I, I placed a lot of value on going from one finish to two, like it's great, but it's, it's not as big. And so that's something that I had wrestled with for much of the past six years since I finished, like, can I do this again? If I'm not, if I don't have that same level of, of motivation and, and fire for it. And, and so, you know, being able to still will myself onward, uh, without that little bit of extra incentive was it's a big confidence boost for me to kind of exert that level of control over myself yeah i can understand that it's it's something i've heard ultra runners in disgusting distance events uh, uh, say over and over again is that you have to know your why you know, you, you have to have a thing that you hold on to that keeps moving you forward as you get there. It's it, it must be good to know that you can dig into yourself and find that re sort of regardless of the situation. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Well, one thing that 
I mean, I'm talking about that like suddenly all the pressure's off you. The the Barclays is very different to races that I've been in direct contact in for a number of reasons. And I mean, one of them is I'm I'm used to events that in some cases have a checkpoint every 10 kilometers with, with a medic waiting there and they've got radios and GPS and first aid kits and everything else. And it, it, even on the spine where there's almost an illusion of you being completely isolated we've always got a mountain rescue team hiding behind a shrub somewhere that could leap out on you if needs be the the barclays from the outside at least looks like you are swinging around up there without a safety net at all and it is i guess first my question is is that how it feels on the ground and and how does that add to how you feel during the event does it does it feel like more pressure as a consequence of that so Barkley has 100% self extraction uh, over all years. No one has ever had to had a search and party rescue sent out to, to bring them back. Some people have hitchhiked back to camp on their own and uh, other such things. But the way the course is constructed as a loop, uh, there's really never not an easy way back to camp. There are a couple spots where you would have to do a climb and then a drop to get back to camp but there there are roads on all sides of this loop essentially uh and and camp is kind of you you can cut from that loop back through the interior to camp from from nearly any spot uh there's one there's one kind of in the northwest corner of the park where if you were to exit in just the right way then you you keep wandering clear up to kentucky uh without hitting anything but otherwise it's um, as long as you have some idea of what you're doing and where you're going and how to read a map, which anyone in this race should, uh, then you're you're never more than two or three miles from safety. I mean, not that that burst the bubble for us in terms of it now seeming an easier race. We're still talking about you making your own way back, naving your own way back. This is it. It still feels like less obviously support than you might receive on other races and it is is that maybe part of what appeals about this challenge a little bit that in other environments there is this illusion of being isolated out there but actually there is a hand on your shoulder that it doesn't seem from the outside at least like there ever really is a hand on your shoulder on on the Barclays yeah I mean once once you leave the gate you're you're on your own and so that is, uh, you, you know, there's there's a chance you might encounter another runner or maybe you're with another runner. Um, but, yeah, that's that's a big part of it is just the solitude you, you have out there. And the density of the forest really contributes to that where, you know, if you're not within 100 meters of someone, you probably don't even know that they're there. And so you, you don't get this kind of feedback of oh there's someone off in the distance or there's headlight or oh i can see town down there it's it's very dense forests and and steep undulating mountains so you, you don't have these reference points and it can very much feel like you're you're closed in and in, in this little box on your own um I mean, we talk about being on your own. You were sort of part of a pack during this uh, during this race, which was sort of a fairly unique experience watching watching that unfold. Um, obviously, Damien was with you for quite a while. I don't want to, you know, breathe too much fire into the uh, UK US rivalry going on between the two of you. There's there's plenty of tea based banter in there already. But once you get into that race environment, do you guys? So you must know each other well by now. Do you? Do you, are you focused and you were just near each other because you both had a similar plan or are you pushing each other along at that point is it are you are the runners supporting each other in a group like that yeah absolutely um and, and so some of that is fairly simple and straightforward like you, you know we come to one of the book one of the books in a group one person takes the time to stop get the book out rip everyone's pages out hand them around, put the book back, that gives everyone else a chance to, you know, maybe change their kit, get some food out, do whatever, uh, and and then we'll rotate at the next book. And, and so that's a small time saver that really adds up. Uh, things like that, supporting one another when you do hit those low points. The main thing, though, in a race like this, uh, 
everyone is going to have their careless, stupid moments. Uh, if you lose focus for just a minute, it's easy to, you know, take off going down the wrong ridge line. And before you know it, uh, you're wandering around Petros getting brought back to camp by the sheriff, like happened to Carl last year. Yeah. Um, so the main thing is, you know, say, say everyone is going to make 10 decisions and every 10th decision is going to be a stupid, careless decision. If you're on your own, that's, that's a lot of mistakes to make. Uh, if you're going to, you're going to lose a lot of time there. Whereas, you know, if, if you're with someone else and you assume that you're each making a bad decision every 10th decision but they're independent of one another the chances that you both make the same bad decision at the same time is very very low so it's really just about eliminating those poor choices and mistakes and covering up each other's stupid yeah that makes perfect sense. It, it, accountability, just an, another pair of eyes on what you're doing must be priceless, it, it, especially to come back to sleep deprivation again. You you guys are tired beyond what most mere mortals can imagine. Um, and speaking of sleep deprivation, once again, I, uh, I felt a bit mean interviewing you again. Uh, the guys that I work with back here in the UK, they, they were very excited by the idea. So I opened up the idea that they may be might want to ask you a couple of questions as well. So if you don't mind, sure. um, we seem to have segued into one of them anyway. So Chris King, uh, I don't know if you're aware of him. Uh, it, when you're performing at your level, does it start to become a question about who can stay awake the longest and manage sleep deprivation best? And do you think there's value in, in other ultra runners learning more about sleep science? Yeah, it's definitely one of many factors, and it's definitely one of those that can cause a failure at, at Barclay. Uh, we've, we've seen that before. It's one of those tough things where I don't think that you can make your body need less sleep. Like, you can't train it to be more resilient against sleep deprivation, but what you can do is learn how it's going to affect you uh, what steps you can take to to minimize uh, that or maybe try to stay awake. Uh, Damien had made fun of my, my noises that I, I grunt at myself to, to keep myself awake, but it's, it's effective for me. Uh, learning when to time caffeine, uh, when a nap is necessary versus pushing through, whether you do better with short naps or longer ones. The main thing for me is has been learning my own circadian rhythm like I, I know there are i am going to get hit a low point i am going to be extremely tired before and after sunrise and late afternoon around 3 or 4 p.m every time every day and i know that like i'm going to get to those points when i get to that point it's because i'm in that time window if i can push through maybe take a little bit of caffeine just before that then i'm fine once i come out the other side and I have to remember that, like, this isn't the end. This is something I'm going to pop back out of. I just I have to make it through. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. As you say, you can't rewire yourself to not require sleep, but you can prepare yourself for the consequences of not having enough of it. Yep. Which I guess leads me loosely to Chris's follow-up question was, how long do you reckon you could run continuously if sleep wasn't a factor? <laughs> Oh, if I never had to sleep? Yeah, let's just take it out. We're in a we're in that dream world oh. now. Take that off the table. How long do you think your legs could carry you? You keep fueling, you keep doing the right thing. Oh, that's that's a that's an interesting question. Um and I guess it also depends on what your definition of run is. <laughs> um I should have got Chris to specify yeah, a few of the factors yeah, here a little I bit mean, before we run in. When I did the Wayne rides, that, that was five and a half days and I was starting to run out of gas uh, pretty bad towards the end. And, and I mean, part of that is because I feel like once you do get close to the end, your body can tend to start to relax <laughs> prematurely. Um, like, like I did running from Cat's Bells to Keswick, which is just a long, flat stretch of 
easy where I felt like I was done, but I wasn't done. Um, but yeah, my, <clears throat> my legs were definitely starting to struggle a bit then. Um, I, you know, it's all going to come down to pacing though. Uh, you know, some of these long FKT, like the Appalachian trail, the PCT, the ones like that, people were out there for months. Um, and, and so, you know, I, I'd like to think I could keep going, uh, if, if I were eating properly and pacing myself properly, uh, and not needing sleep, I, I could continue at a slow shuffle, uh, for, you know, weeks, but, you know, again, that circles back to what's, what's your definition of, of running. Some people object to that term being used for Barkley even. Yeah, <laughs> fair enough. I, I think we'll just have to hope at this point that Chris is satisfied with that as an answer. So uh, there you go, Chris. That was for you. And um, lastly, because I did promise not to keep you for too much longer, but you've been doing really well during this little interview of sort of preempting the next thing I was going to ask. And uh, Dean Reed asks, um, you obviously made a bit of a name for yourself for setting ridiculous FKTs while you were over here in the UK. You've already mentioned the Appalachian Trail, the PCT. Those are on Dean's list of of possible things for you to maybe do. Do you, do you think you're now going to look for some home turf FKTs to look into? And what sort of difference in mindset would you see there having to be to do something as long as the Appalachian Trail compared to, as much as it hurts people who are affiliated with the Spine Race to say it, something relatively short in comparison like the Pennine Way? It's so, I mean, the Appalachian Trail has always been kind of my holy grail of, of FKTs. Uh, it's largely a matter of um, having the time for it. I mean, having the time uh, for my family life, for my professional life, I uh, can, I would definitely want to make my family a part of that event rather than just, you know, bye, we'll be back in a couple months, going to go run really far. Uh, so definitely would love to do that. Uh, would love to, um, be able to have the time for it, but, but we'll have to see, we'll have to see how my job progresses and, and everything else. And, and in the meantime, uh, there are some, you know, Wainwrights slash Penine way distance, uh, FKTs here that, that are some of them sections of the Appalachian trail or, or the, the, um, PCT, uh, the John Muir Trail is a great section of uh, the, the PCT uh, in the Sierra Nevada that would be about the same amount of time as the Penine Way. So definitely some some things I've, I've got my eye on, and we'll just we'll see how they might fit into the calendar and how how conditions might cooperate as, as well. Right now, uh, the JMT is under a lot of snow, and it yeah. might might not be doable this year. Well, fingers crossed. I know Dean will be watching. Um, if you do head into uh, any more FKT attempts, and obviously I will as well. Um, I've got one last question on my list, and I will make this one the last one, I promise. Uh, having done this twice now, if there is anybody out there with the misfortune to find their way into the next Barclays, what would you recommend? Have you got one thing they should definitely be doing more of to be ready for this? Failing. Yeah. Get, get, get comfortable with the idea of failing. Uh, you know, whether that's actually going out and doing things that are hard and have a high chance of failure or just kind of getting your mindset used to that, uh, understanding that it's it's about reaching as far as you possibly can, reaching those limits. And, uh, you know, the goal is, is for that to be past a finish or past a fun run or, or whatever else the, the goal is. But uh, don't be discouraged. Don't... Um, look at it as, as a setback uh, if if it doesn't end up being quite what you expected. Look at it as an opportunity for learning and and growth. Uh, and as long as you you did what you can do, gave it your best, that's a that's a big success. Perfect. Perfect. I think that's the ideal note to leave this on, John. Uh, I'm gonna let you get back to your work day. Um, but yeah. Congratulations again, and thanks once again for taking the time to chat today. I really appreciate it. Thanks very much. Good afternoon, then, 
and I can't quite believe I'm getting to say this, but good afternoon then to Keith Dunn. Keith, uh, how are you? I'm good. How are you this morning or afternoon for you? Morning uh, for me. Yeah, yeah, very much morning for you. Sorry, um, I, I'm having a lovely day, pal. You are, <laughs> you are the icing on the cake. I, I, I mean, I've, I've already done my sort of fanboy bit where I, uh, I told you that I've been following your Twitter sort of religiously every time the Barclays come around for the last few years, and this year in particular, I don't, I don't think I really got a lot of sleep in that sixty hours. Um, my girlfriend was lost to my phone. Um, I, it, it, I'm just absolutely riveted to what you've been doing. So thank you very much. And thank you for taking the time today. Thank you uh, for having me. Oh my, yeah, absolutely a pleasure. Now, we, we chatted a little bit before this got started and, and I don't often have a lot of time to do a lot of research for these episodes. But generally, I've at least Googled the runners or, or whoever it is I'm talking to and found out a bit beforehand. There's not a lot of Keith Dunn facts out there. So we're, we're sort of starting from the beginning here. So for the benefit of anyone who doesn't know who Keith Dunn is, Keith Dunn is the unofficial voice of the Barclay Marathons. He is the Twitter account to get live updates from that yellow gate. How on earth, Keith? Did that come about? When, when did you start doing this, and and how did it happen? It it came about accidentally. It was um, I had joined Twitter in February of two thousand nine, and uh, didn't really know why. Uh, it was a new toy to me, and I kind of was like, okay, now I've joined Twitter. Now what do I do? And it occurred to me that one of the things that it could be useful for would be providing updates to ultra marathons. And that's a concept, of course, that many people have, have just run off with and, and do a fantastic job. But there's just me. And and I thought, okay, now how how would this work exactly? How do I, you know, if you have a point to point hundred mile or, or even a loop, how do you follow everybody all around the course and, and do updates unless you've got half a dozen or a dozen people doing it? And then I thought, wait a minute, Barkley, uh, Yellow Gate. I mean, that's where everything happens. Uh, everything and nothing happens at the yellow gate, right? I mean, that's where you see the runners in between loops. That's where they start. That's where they finish. That's where they drop out. Most often, that's where they drop out. Um, and um, so I thought this is the perfect place. And so I approached uh, Laz with the idea. And um, I, I think it's fair to say that that he allowed it. And, um, and you know, it just went from there. Yeah, it- there's a sort of bubble around the spine and there has been for a, for a long time. And, and you're sort of going back to a time here in 2009 that sort of before the documentary that, that sort of brought the race to the international running crowd. Um, so there really can't have been any window into the race before that, right? Had, how was Laz about you suddenly providing a little window into, into what goes on there? Um, extremely skeptical. <laughs> the race, um, you know, the Barkley is for the runners. The Barkley is not for spectators. And um, I, I think he was very nervous about the concept. Uh, as you said, you know, pre-documented, the only way that you could get information about the race was after the race, you know, uh, through the race reports. And uh, I think the this was a foreign concept. And with Barkley, of course, you know, less is more. And so, you know, I, and, and fortunately, Laz and I think the same about these things. Uh, and so I said, look, all I want to do is provide a, a taste of what's going on. We're, there's never going to be a photo of, them, of the course, obviously. There's never going to be, no one can ever reproduce a complete entrance list from my tweets. Um, and that's still true, actually. Uh, and so, you know, just, but just to give people a taste of what's happening and give them a sense. And he thought that that was, you know, worth exploring. And so the first year or two, I think we were just kind of, uh, you know, testing to see whether the concept would work. And, and it has. Yeah. Yeah, it most definitely has. I mean, it, you gave me some numbers just before I started recording. Like, what has your Twitter following gone up by over the last couple of years, would you say? Uh, you know, it's it's the last... The first few years, it just went up in bits and spurts, I think, just a little bit each year. Um, 2000, 
one, I think, is when it jumped from thirty or thirty-five thousand to close to fifty thousand. I end, uh, ended up at forty-seven thousand. People will unfollow me after Barclays over, which you know I get it. Um, they don't want to hear about fish all year long. <laughs> um, and uh, then this year we jumped from forty-seven thousand to sixty-five thousand. Wow. <laughs> Yeah, not bad going uh, for a one-man media team. I mean, you mentioned back then to, that to sort of cover a race, you'd need a half dozen people running around with you. And that's that's kind of what I'm used to doing the Montane Spine Race. We, we've we got photographers and videographers out there doing stuff 24 hours a day, like as full spectrum coverage as much as we can manage. And it's, it's, it's hard work. Like it, it, there is a lot to juggle. And then I find myself in my own time, absolutely transfixed by what you're doing. Like you, you do just give that little glimpse of what's going on in there. It's sort of just enough to keep people tethered in. That's got to be quite a difficult balance, right? Because you must now increasingly be having people going, we want more, you know, give us the real names, give us the full list. I mean, it, that's got to be quite a difficult balance to strike, right? Well, um, it is. Uh, it's, it, it is and it isn't. You know, uh, one of the things that works in my favor is cell reception is very poor out there. So I actually, you know, try to send more tweets than actually get out. So there's sort of a self-selective thing going on there just because of the nature of the, of the service that we get out there. Um, but beyond that, we just try to uh, it, it, we try to strike that balance. You, you know, one of the things, not all the runners want people to know they're there. I've specific, I've had runners specifically ask me, please do not mention me in your tweets. Absolutely respect that. Of course I've had other runners that, Hey, I've got family, I've got my mom's wife, you know, whoever. And, um, you know, they want to be mentioned and we try to accommodate that as well. So it, it, it's a bit of self-selection there. It, it all works out in the end. Um, this year we did something different. It, it just, it just kind of happened, uh, and, uh, turned out to be very amusing for all of us in camp. So, you know, we just stopped naming people for the first loop or two. They became descriptions. Uh, and we had a great deal. I by the way. Yeah. That that was great. (laughs) We, it, it, it started off kind of accidentally. Someone was up at the tower saying, okay, um, you know, John Kelly just came by. Uh, a guy with glasses just came by a guy I don't know with a mohawk just came by and so we're sitting in camp going okay we're just going to use descriptions for everybody Um, and so that's what we did and um, that turned out to be a lot of fun for us it's a lot of fun for you but it seems to be a lot of fun for the guys that are tracking the event on Twitter as well. Like it, it, within a few minutes of you putting any kind of a tweet out, there's new spreadsheets appearing with these descriptions and an idea of who that may or may not be. Like people are scouring information like they're trying to solve a true crime. It's it's incredible. And I, I have to say from my side, it, it does feel like a little bit transgressive like i'm not supposed to be peeking this far behind the scenes of what's going on it's sort of as you say this is this is for the runners what you're doing over there um but it it just seems to add to it It, it, it's maddening and i will sit there and wait an hour for you to tweet if if i know that we're around a time when i think one of the spreadsheets has said that mohawk guy might be about to appear in a particular place it, it it seems to work really, really well for you guys. But there, I suppose there must be a part of this where another part of the reason why you sort of limit the coverage is to limit the size of the race. Because I, I know the Barclay has to maintain quite a small footprint on the ground. Is that right? Absolutely. Uh, for environmental reasons, uh, we the course goes near some environmentally sensitive reasons uh, areas. And so the, the footprint is limited for that reason. And, and just there's a capacity issue just in camp that, you know, there's there's only so many people that fit into that space. And so it's it's very limited as to who who actually can be there. Yeah, I bet. I, I, I will you... say that the um, you, you, you know, pe- people do get frustrated. I, I get some rather nasty comments about why aren't why aren't you giving us more information about this person or why are you using just descriptions or whatever? The what you 
what people get reading the updates on Twitter is pretty much what we see. Um, you know, uh, you know, I'll tweet, you know, six people just arrived at the gate altogether. Well, that's what's happened. And, and, you know, people in camp don't necessarily know much more than that unless they're right there at the gate and they know all six of them. Uh, so, you, you know, it's, it's, we, we try to give you a sense of, of the race, but I mean, honest to God, that's what we're seeing in camp as well. Yeah, I can imagine actually, like the kind of races that I work on, you've got 24 hour a day GPS coverage. I can, I can tell you within a few meters where any of the runners are at any given time, probably their average speed of advance when they left the last checkpoint, their estimated time of arrival at the next one. And all this information's out in the public domain. I guess that's what people are getting used to from a, from a big race as it were. And then they come across the Barclays and if they're just coming across it for the first time and they don't know the history, it's hang on, why aren't they telling me anything? And that's, that's just what it is. That's what they get. Well, it, you, you know, it, that's an interesting point. I've argued for a long time that um, we should put GPS trackers uh, on the runners and then just let us in camp watch them and see how far off course they get. Um, what, what's interesting is, you know, we, we don't know where the runners are until they come back. And oftentimes... Not, you know, when they come back, they don't know where they've been. Um, so, you know, we, I can't tell you at any given time. Somebody asked me, you know, can you update so and so? Well, I, I don't know. They could be on Ratjaw. They could be, you know, miles off course at the Gobi Church. I, I don't know where they are. You know, I'll find out when they come back and tell me if if they even know. Wow. <laughs> yeah, I just. Yeah, absolutely amazing. So in that case, you know, what you're putting out there is a reflection really of, of what you guys know around camp as well. I guess everybody out on that course is having an individual experience and you can't give everyone in the world a window into what they're seeing out there. And that's one of the things that I think I really like about the event is is that it is a bit of a mystery. Um, I, what about you personally, and your attachment outside of your Twitter account, like you mentioned before this, that you had actually been on that spark, uh, that starting list yourself. So, how did your relationship with the Barclay begin? It's it's 2005, I believe. Um, I'd have to go back and read Frozen Ed's book to to remember. But at the last minute, uh, three spots came open in the race, and I, you know, I've been friends with a number of people who have done the race, David Horton. Uh, Mike Burr, Mike Dobies, others. And I, you know, when uh, last posted, you know, hey, I have three spots open, first come, first served. Um, I asked, you know, my friends, hey, should I even try this? And they're like, absolutely, you need to experience this. You need to be there. So I deliberately waited a day. Um, so because I wanted to say, well, I tried to get in, but couldn't because I figured that the spots would go really quickly. So the next day I sent as an email and i said hey i'm interested if there's any slots left i'm sure they're all taken and within minutes i got an email back saying well the first two went and then we just sort of waited on the third and your luck has just run out and so that's how i got in the first time and um i actually participated uh, two more times after that in 2006 and 7 i believe i could be off a year I was not a success at Barkley. Uh, I've the furthest I've ever gone is half a loop, um, and uh, so I, you know, I switched back in those days. It was it was a lot easier for people who had been involved in the race to just come down and, and be part of the experience. And so in two thousand nine, I actually uh, was was in and withdrew. And then came up with the idea of tweeting the race. And so that's that's where all that began. Things must have changed an awful lot after that documentary. I mean, we've we've talked about the last year or two since lockdown. You know, people have been pinned to your Twitter feed a lot more. But there must be a sort of post and pre-documentary Barclay in a way. Like, how have things changed since even when you were first involved? Well, you know, when, when I first went down back, I remember I'm old enough to remember when when, you know, your elite runners, a lot of the elite runners were like, oh, 
Barkley is not a real race. Barkley is just, you know, dumb. It's, it's, it's not designed for anybody to finish. Why would I waste my time? And, uh, but but even then you had runners like you know Blake Wood, Dave Horton, who came came year after year until they finished, uh, and other elites as well. Uh, the documentary I think really just it, it opened up a, a window that nobody had ever seen. Nobody had ever actually you know unless you'd been there, unless you'd run the event, uh, you had no idea what was going on. And so the documentary just really put that spotlight on the entire race and everyone was like, wow, this is, this is awesome. You know, I want to do it. And then of course um, it became a bucket list item for a lot of people. So just the, the popularity exploded. Uh, The other thing that added uh, to the popularity of the race uh, and, you know, cause and effect, I'm not sure what, which here, but um, you know, the Barkley fall classic came along in an effort to give people a taste of the Barkley, you know, after the explosion in his popularity, you know, last started the fall classic and people have come yeah. and, and that's made the, the race even more visible because, you know, you can actually go run rat jaw. You can actually go run testicle spectacle. You can, you know, be on these parts of the course that, um, you know, get a taste of what Barkley is like. And so, uh, yeah, and and then the whole rise of social media, in general, has has contributed greatly. Um, y- y- you know, ten years ago, there were not people creating spreadsheets and trying to fill out, you know, who was in and who was where and all that kind of thing. That is a more recent phenomenon. Do you get involved when that kind of stuff happens? Like, if you see one of the spreadsheets pop up. Are you having a look through it, seeing if they've got it right or wrong, or do, do you just sort of let that stuff happen out in the world on its own? I um, people will send me, you know, here, here's the spreadsheet, you know, who's who's, and and I'll I'll look at it. I never ever comment. I I don't uh, one way or the other. Um, I have yet to see one that's right. By the way, um, yeah, the top, <laughs> well, from, yeah you've preempted probably my next question. Um, yeah, they're all, they, they've all, they've all got mistakes. Everyone that I've seen, at least I have yet to see a complete, you know, starters list, uh, published accurately. Um, and that's good. I, you know, yeah. but I don't get involved in that. That's Love it. my, my job is to update the race. My job is not to, uh, help people, uh, you know, construct information that they really don't need. Do you do you feel any pressure when Barkley Week comes around? Because uh, I mean, I I know I do going into a into a spine race or any of the other events. I uh, I do, and and I'm only speaking then sort of through the social media accounts of the, of those races themselves. I'm not I'm not speaking as me, as it were. You're just you're Keith Dunn, and you're out there. Like, do you do you feel <laughs> some pressure personally when when you uh when you're at that gate? I. I you know it's it's funny i do um and uh, if you see the pictures of me that were taken this year that have been spread around you know i've always got at least two phones in my hand uh reception there is poor and every year i stress about and and this will begin weeks before the race you know okay which carrier is 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 the the better one to use which phone is the better one to use interestingly Older model phones do better out there than than more recent models because more recent models take up more, you know, uh, bandwidth. And so I really do stress about that. But once I get out there, once um, once the conk and the other part of that is I never know. The last doesn't tell me when he's going to blow the conk. So I've got to be, you know, once that happens and I get that tweet out, then I'm set. Then I'm fine because, every you know. I know everything's going to work. I know I'm not going to miss the start. And uh, then everything falls into place after that. Yeah. Yeah, I can imagine. And I, how much involvement will you and Lav has, uh, you and Laz have during an event? Like, is, is he in on the coverage you're doing? Or are you doing that sort of separate from, from whatever he's up to? Um, no, he participates. Um, and again, that's been, that's, that's grown over the years. Uh, but you know, once we started this year, for example, once we started getting, you know, descriptions of people rather than names from the fire tower, you know, he, he was, you know, he's the one that, that, uh, 
suggested or at least you know uh you know prodded uh egged on i you know whatever you want to say he uh he's the one that uh got he was definitely in on the whole you know describing people rather than naming them and uh you know some of the names didn't match the people uh necessarily you know guy with glasses uh was john kelly and john doesn't wear glasses no <laughs> and 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 laz's comment was yeah but i could picture him wearing glasses um so he absolutely you know participates in this and um you know we have a good time with it brilliant oh oh man i can picture it it, it this sounds like a, a dream of a race coverage gig um I, look, I can see we're already at 20 minutes, and I promised that I wouldn't take up too much of your time, given that you are well, sat you, in your you know, office right now. If, if, if you uh, if you want to continue on for a couple of minutes, uh, no one's bothering me yet, so we're good. Well, good stuff. Until we get any interruptions then, from you having covered the race for the last few years then, what what are some favorite moments that you've been around for? Oh, my God. Um, fin watching people finish. I mean, you know um john kelly in 2017 uh you know all three of them this year uh you, you know it's it's amazing to just watch people defeat the course and uh come in and and just and there's really you know you know this because of the spine i mean the spine is 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 you know a difficult piece of its own uh, but watching people, you know, succeed and watching people, uh, you know, it finishes is just the most amazing thing. And it's something that I love very much. Uh, the other side, and and I probably shouldn't get into specific stories uh, because I don't want to embarrass either myself or others, uh, is the spectacular failures. Um, people that, you know, get to a certain distance and either get hopelessly lost, um, or, you know, just completely lose it mentally and end up, you know, someplace way far away from where they thought they were. Um, uh, some of the, some of the, um, hallucination stories are, are pretty remarkable. Um, but again, nature of the beast, sleep deprivation, um, you know, and, and I can say that they're favorites only because we've never had anybody, you know, injured or seriously hurt. So, you know, they make for great stories. Yeah, they do. Once everything's calmed down and you know everyone's safe, the sleep monsters Absolutely. are always good for stories. And I, I loved hearing what you said there and, you know, it, just the look on your face when you were talking about the finish line, because I've tried to explain this to people over and over again. I feel like I get a little bit a little bit of what they're feeling every time they cross the line and it, it, it i love that I, I love watching people's idea of who they are and what they're capable of changes in a moment when they do something like that and i, I can only imagine it's like that or even bigger when they when they get to that yellow gate at the end of the barclay so yeah deeply jealous you've you've been there to to see all of those <laughs> that's outstanding well Keith, uh, as much as I'd like to talk for the rest of the day, um, I know you've got a day of work to get to, um, but I just wanted to say thank you for chatting to me today, um, for agreeing to be on the podcast. It's It's been an absolute pleasure to talk to you. Thank you for having me. I, I really have enjoyed talking with you. I've enjoyed meeting you. I, um, I follow the spine. I love the spine. And so this has been uh, great fun for me. Awesome. Me too. Me too, man. I'm a big fan, genuinely. And I, I look forward to, uh, to reading your tweets all the way through the race next year as well. Well, I'll be there, hopefully, Lord willing. <laughs> awesome. Well, have a great day, Keith, and thank you, you very too. much. All right. Thank you. Well, there you go. I hope you enjoyed those interviews as much as I enjoyed recording them. Uh, I had a fantastic time putting this episode together. So thanks for sticking with us. Now stick with us a little longer. I'm going to hand over now to the amazing Adam Kimball for the latest Radness update. Adam is our eyes in America, and he's going to give us a little view now into that American ultra running scene. Um, I, definitely stick with us for this. I learned a ton from this little feature. 
We will be back soon. Keep an eye out for more episodes of Everything Endurance. It is best if you subscribe to us. So wherever you are listening to this podcast, hit subscribe now and you will never miss an episode. I know we can be a little erratic with our release dates, so don't be hanging around. Get an update as soon as one comes out. Hit that subscription button now. Thanks very much, guys. I'll speak to you again soon. Hello, everybody. This is Beyond the Ultimate Race Director, Adam Kimball, coming to you live from Lake Tahoe in Northern California with this episode's radness update. I'm excited to get into it. I was thinking about some of like the the bigger races in the U.S. and what the the ultra running scene is like here, and and maybe some processes that people outside of the U.S. might not be as familiar with. Maybe maybe you are. Maybe you've read up on it, but I just want to get into it because some of the races I'm going to talk about here are really important and a and a big part of you know kind of the what makes up the biggest races on the scene, at least over here in the States. So I'll tell you what got, what got me thinking about this was a few weeks ago, I ran a, a race called the Badwater Cape Fear 51 miler. It's in Bald Head Island, North Carolina on the East coast of the United States. I won that race and set a course record. I was very happy with that. And in doing so, um, I achieved what I came to that race to achieve. And that was getting an automatic entry into the 2024 Badwater 135. Now, the Badwater 135, if you're not familiar with it, has the tagline, the world's toughest foot race, uh, very infamous race. It's in Death Valley, the hottest place in the U.S., in the hottest month of the year, July. So, you know, incredibly hot temperatures for a 135-mile road race. And uh, it's just one of those races that over time has kind of this image has been built around it about how tough it is and the stories that come along with it. You know, there's been stories in the past of people's shoes starting to melt on the pavement because it's so hot, things like that. So, uh, and it's been around since the eighties. So it's also one of the older hundred milers in the U S and, uh, anyway, really cool history around the race. I'm really excited to run it next year, but the fact that I qualified for it, there's, there's three races put on by Badwater and their race director, Chris Cosman. Those races are the 135, the Cape fear race that I ran and then Badwater salt and sea. And Cape Fear and Salton Sea serve as qualifiers for the Badwater 135. And so that's what got me thinking about some of the other biggest races in the U.S., particularly the oldest 100-miler in the world, the Western States Endurance Run, a 100-miler in June in Olympic Valley, starts in Olympic Valley right here in Tahoe and goes to Auburn, California. That is, you know, um, again, one of the most iconic races in, in our world and there are a bunch of races that feed into that, that cre- that make it so competitive. I mean, Western States is, is one of the deepest fields, both on the men's and women's sides that you get every single year. And there's a couple reasons for that because it's a very small race. The Western States endurance run is capped at 369 runners every year, but that's a rolling average. So for example, if, you know, in one year there's 20 people before race day or so that don't run, and it goes down to 349, then the next year, technically 389 could line up. And it's either a five or 10 year rolling average. So there's always a little bit of wiggle room, but the point is every year under 400 runners run this race, right? And it's it's one of the most iconic races in the world. Um, you know, whereas UTMB, another really iconic 100 mile race, thousands of people run that every year. So even if you don't get into that one year, you know, you're likely to qualify and get in probably the very next year. Whereas this year at Western States, the lottery is held every December. The race is the following June. So in December of 2022, there were several people, I forget the number, maybe eight people that had been in the lottery for nine straight years. And what that means is for nine consecutive years, these people have had to run a qualifying race, which the shortest qualifying races are 100K. Um, then they've entered the lottery, haven't been drawn. And one of these people, uh, his name is Jason. He's a friend of mine and I coach him. He was in the lottery for the ninth straight year and he finally got drawn this year. Thankfully, all of the nine year people got drawn in the lottery. So they'll all be running this year. But the point in saying that is it's a very, very competitive, hard to get into. I mean, the race itself is competitive. It's also competitive just to get into the race. And so, you know, you might think, how how is the competition so deep every year? Well, there's a few reasons for that. One, in addition to the lottery, 
I think around 300, maybe two, 275 to 300, something like that, names are drawn in the lottery. So then that, that leaves an additional, you know, 50 to 100 people that get into the race. And so how do those people get in? Well, there's a few different reasons. You can get in through uh, some sponsorship entries. There are a handful of those. In fact, I ran in 2022 and Buff, one of my sponsors, gave me a sponsored entry. So I was able to get in that way. So you can get really talented athletes um, getting in through sponsored entries. Um, there are aid station entries. So everybody that has an aid station at the race every year gets an entry and they can do with that what they choose. So people can get in that way. Um, and there are a few other ways. But the main way that, that the elite athletes are able to get into the race is through a process called the Golden Ticket Race Series. So there are seven races. Um, I think three of them are international. And in those races, if you finish in the top two males or females, then you get automatic entry into the next year's or the next edition of the Western States, because some of those races take place early in the year, like this year, 2023, we still have one more golden ticket race to go. And the top two males and females will get entry into this year's Western States. So the way it works is it's the top two males and females get in. If the ticket is declined by anybody, then it rolls down and it'll roll down as far as fifth place. So if you finish sixth place in your, uh, in your gender, then you can't get into the race, but if you finish fifth, and, and the first and three of the first four decline for any number of reasons, then you can still get in. So one example of what this looks like at UTMB last year, the top three finishes on the men's side were Killian Jornet, Mathieu Blanchard and Tom Evans. Killian declined his ticket, Mathieu accepted, and so did Tom. So that means uh, Tom, while he wasn't in the top two, still got a ticket in. And then funny enough, he ran another one of the, the golden ticket races, the Black Canyon 100K in February. He finished second. And in a, in a funny sort of, I guess, ironic in some ways, um, twist of events, the third place finisher at that race got to accept the ticket. And so it was a reversal of what had happened to Tom with UTMB. But anyway, so there are these seven races and uh, it, it, they're all so very highly competitive UTMB is the first one. Then there's the Javelina 100 uh, miler. It's in Arizona in the States. Then the Doi Inthanon 100 miler in Thailand. The Bandera 100K in Texas in the States. Uh, the Tarawera 100K in New Zealand. The Black Canyon 100K that I mentioned a, a bit ago in Arizona. And then the final one is coming up later this month, uh, very close to where I live here in Tahoe. It's the Canyons 100K, and that takes place in Auburn on some of the same trails that Western States has run on. So just two months out from the race, four more people are going to secure their entry into Western States. You know, it's an amazing thing. It's really exciting. And, and I just wanted to, to share a little bit about that process because I, I don't know that everybody's familiar with how it works, but there's this, this big pool of races, seven races, ultimately 28 different people secure their entry into Western States. And it's unbelievably competitive. I mean, these it's, it's amazing. The most competitive races in the States outside of Western States are these golden ticket races. And it's because people so badly want to secure their entry into the race. So it's a really special thing. Um, if you weren't aware of this, check it out. Canyons has a live stream. Uh, it's coming up here in a few weeks. So go check out the race and do a little prep learning about Western States. And uh, maybe follow some of these athletes that, that get entry into, into the race at the end of June.